Lord, we thank you for the power of the word, and we come to the word humbly and broken before you and ask you to speak to our hearts. Lord, we have nothing to say unless the Spirit brings it to birth. That which you birthed in our hearts, Lord, that which you gave us as we waited upon you, we bring now to this people. And we pray, Lord, that you speak deeply into our hearts, life-changing word. Speak to my heart and change me in the process of preaching it and speaking it. Lord, we give all honor and glory to your name. We are gathered in your name to hear your word. So we give us open ears and open hearts to hear the word in Christ's name. Amen. I read to you uh, the 28th chapter, verse 16, beginning to read. And when we were come to Rome, this is Paul. Remember, he was in Jerusalem and they, they tried to kill him in Jerusalem and he appealed to Caesar. The Lord had told him he was to go to Rome and God was going to do a, a work for him through him. In the city of Rome, this is the head of this is the capital of the great Roman Empire. In verse 16, when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered or allowed to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. Let's go now to verse 30 and 31. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, and with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And in the original Greek, it's also in the New American Standard and other uh, references and other scriptures, with all confidence, no man hindering him. The word is hinder. Now, the, the, he was totally unhindered. The gospel he preached and Paul himself were unhindered. In the original Hebrew, it reads, Paul proceeded and taught the gospel with all openness, unhindered, unobstructed, unstopped, without delay. For two years, the scripture says, with all confidence, no man hindering him. Now, once you get this picture, if you will, please, this is quite an amazing scripture emblazoned in the word of God. And it closes out the ministry of Paul. We're not going to hear about Paul's ministry from here on. In fact, after this last, this is the last of his ministry is wrapped up. He's going to be martyred here. And he's in prison now. He's in a nondescript house, a rent house that he's been permitted to rent. And he has a soldier guarding him. In fact, he was chained in that, that place. He could not go to the corner. He could not go for, to a street meeting. He could not advertise his meetings. A nondescript house in, in a, uh, uh, just a uh, far off alley street, perhaps. <clears throat> and this is the man that God has sent to evangelize Rome. Here's the man that God has sent to to raise up an army that would move through the whole Roman Empire and affect it for ages to come. Is this the plan of God? Now, how does he reach Rome? Now, Rome at this time is given over to homosexuality. It was not only an accepted, respected lifestyle. It was a preferred lifestyle among the intelligentsia. Nero, the emperor, was killing Christians and others on the streets And in in the palace court, this society, remember that Roman Empire collapsed eventually, but its very roots and its foundation, it was lust, it was uh, money, it was fame. All hell had broken loose on the streets of Rome. Many, many that were being killed. And... All of the intelligentsia was against anything that was religious except the cults. And how does God come into a situation with so many hindrances? These are all hindrances to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The false cults, a government that is persecuting, uh, a Jewish religious system that wants nothing to do with Christ or the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everywhere you look, everywhere you turn, there are nothing but hindrances. There are mountains. There is opposition. And God calls a man 
He's by himself. This time, Timothy's not with him. None of his young soldiers are with him. One converted Jewish terrorist. And that's what Paul was. He's a terrorist. He went into homes and dragged people out of their homes. He was responsible for killing some. And he stood there when it says he consented to, to uh, Stephen stoning. means he participated. Here's a terrorist. And here is God's plan. Is this how God is going to move Rome? Is this how God, by his spirit, is going to come against all the opposition of the enemy? Everything that the devil can do, everything that is in uh, the devil's weaponry is now aimed at this man. There is no chance, humanly speaking, of the gospel breaking through in Rome. Is this God's program? How different from what we see in America and the world today? How different? One converted terrorist who can hardly see, who's being battered every day by Satan, who by his own description is not eloquent, and his speech is contemptible. He's not a celebrity because when he comes to Rome, he calls the Jewish leadership and says, I am here because I've taken a stand for this man, Jesus. And they say, we don't know who you are. We don't know anything about you. There have been no letters sent here. Who are you? That's some reception to the gospel. The man who spent his life, and they say, who are you? And Paul's got this burning and, uh, desire to preach Christ to his fellow, uh, fellow Jews. In fact, Paul watched them. They began to argue among themselves about this Christ. And, and Paul said, you've hardened your hearts. He said, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. I know God sent me here, and there are people going to respond to this gospel. And so for two years, in an undescript rented house, no advertising, no computers, no equipment, no prayer warriors, nobody standing with him. He's all alone, chained to a Roman unbelieving guard. Imagine Paul sitting in that Roman house, knowing that God called him, and he's been through so much. Here's a man that's preached to multitudes. He's been in city squares. He's established churches. And now God wants to reach the city of Rome, and he wants to reach the Roman Empire. Here's Paul sitting there having a prayer meeting by himself. And there's not a discontented muscle in his body. He's in total contentment. Lord, just being here, if that's all it is, you sent me. And if I just, all it is that I am here in your place, not murmuring, not complaining, then the gospel is going to go forth unhindered. No one's going to be able to stop. I don't know your plan, but you told me to come and you put me here. I didn't plan this. You planned it. You see, you can be sitting here in the choir now, and just your being there. That's where God put you. He didn't call you to Africa. He didn't call you to China. He called you to the choir. Then just your being there makes the gospel totally unhindered. Opens up. No devil, no demon of hell can stop what you're doing, what you're singing, what you're saying. You might not see the impact, but the kingdom of God is being impacted. Impacted. It's just Paul being there. You're an usher. God put you there. There's power in that. That unhinders the gospel of Jesus Christ because you're not murmuring, say, well, I wish I was in the choir. No, God put you there. Thank him. And one of your smiles may bring salvation to somebody that's all they needed in this house. Now, what is God's method of building his church in times of dire, consequent, dire hindrances? Is this how you reach cities? And Paul dwelt for two whole years in his rented quarters and received all that came to him. A contented man with no... 
got no committee. One man praying. And, and suddenly, people start coming into this rented house. The Holy Spirit draws them. Because there's a hungry people there, and it's all word of mouth. And Bible says day and night for two years, people came to that little house, that rented house of Paul. And folks, when, when you, you read some of the historians, and when you read, I don't have time to go into, but naming some of the people who were converted in those meetings, that out of that little house, God moved in Rome, established a powerful body of believers, and they went all over the world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ all over through that little rented house. That little house was the Holy Ghost central headquarters for Operation Rome. Where's God moving? Oh, not in the cathedrals. Where is God moving? Not that he can't. Well, is he down in the marketplace? <clears throat> no. Well, where do you go? Well, you have to go down this street, and then you turn left, and then right. And then when you get into the poor section, Paul couldn't afford a house in the high rent area. Paul was a poor man, and he had to pay for his rent. You find it in this nondescript poor little house. No techniques. Is the Holy Ghost trying to say something to his church? I don't believe God is against using modern techniques. Look, look ahead. This is something modern. This, uh, Paul never had this. He didn't have this microphone. He, he, he didn't pastor in a one of these great buildings like I'm preaching from right now I didn't have all of this uh, technical stuff. I'm not against that, and God's not against that. God uses everything, every tool we have we're to use to evangelize the world. But, folks, God is trying to say something that doesn't have to be big. And I think if Paul the Apostle came today and looked at what's happening in the church where, where the techniques are replacing the Holy Ghost... Where methods are, 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 are bringing us to a place where we think God works only on big scale. I think pre Paul would preach downsize. Because he would be talk, taking us through the Bible and he'd be talking about Gideon bringing 30,000 men. And God dunk, took him down, remember, to 10,000. And then he took him down to 300. Because God said, if you think I'm going to use a great host, then you're going to start boasting that you did it. God says, I'm going to take a little hand of people that are dedicated, that are fully given to me, and I will use them. I'm not preaching smallness. I'm preaching that God can use the most humble. He can use anybody that is willing to be shut in with God and stripped of all confidence in the flesh and learning to be wholly dependent on God for everything. Totally believing the power of the gospel and speaking it and living it with confidence. God can do it with anybody. I'm an example of that. God found a skinny little preacher in a little town in Pennsylvania and sent him here to work with gangs and drug addicts and then work with you who are not drug addicts and gang members. There's a History of the Pentecostal movement that started in a little nondescript house in Los Angeles on a quaint little street called Straight or, or Azusa. And this is early 1903, 1904, thereabouts, and the Holy Ghost broke out in a little clapboard house church, an unknown, humble black preacher, Brother Seymour. He used to pray with his head in a wooden box, an empty wooden apple crate. And people would come when the Holy Spirit broke out in Los Angeles. Word spread all through Los Angeles. People would line up to get in. They had prayer meetings, daily prayer meetings in the second floor in, in a room. And the story by witnesses who were there, ministers came from all over the world to that little house. That little rented house. 
with a humble black pastor who did nothing but pray and seek the face of God. And pastors, evangelists, well-known pastors, evangelists would come. And the testimony was when they walk in, they would be so convicted of their sins, they'd fall on their face and begin to weep for hours. What, what am I trying to say? That this gospel of Jesus Christ does not, will not consider any opposition from the world as a hindrance. God, the gospel of Jesus Christ sees no hindrances. There is nothing. Communism couldn't hinder it. The deadness of all the churches at that particular time in the early part of that century, they said it, the religion was totally dead. And God says, I, I don't care what they say. I don't care what the hindrances may be in your eyes. I see no hindrances and I don't need an army. I don't need a lot of money to get this done. I need a man. God's not looking for methods. He's looking for men. He's looking for women that he can touch. God always uses a God-filled Holy Ghost man to accomplish his work. He can do it in the smallest, most insignificant places with the most insignificant people. Paul the Apostle in Rome is not a celebrity. He's an unknown Jew. This man is not discouraged. He said, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. The preaching and the teaching of Paul's gospel of Jesus Christ was spoken, the Bible said, with confidence and unhindered. And this is what, this brings us to our age. You see, we face hindrances that Paul knew nothing about in his generation. There was no homosexual uh, outrage such as we're seeing in, though there was a lot of homosexuality in the Roman Empire. It was not this organized religious thing. Here, here in the state of New York, 410 churches, 410 pastors have signed up for pride in my pulpit, it's called. And it's spreading around the United States. In New York State, 410 pastors already signed up. Pride in my pulpit. That is the homosexual agenda. In other words, we are proud of the homosexual community and we endorse the homosexual community in our church. And I have pride in my pulpit. In other words, I'm with the homosexual pride. The first time, think my Bible said pride goes before destruction and haughty spirit before a fall. The very dangerous thing that is sweeping the United States now. And Paul did not have the in your face valence that we're seeing. We face an Islamic onslaught against Christianity. Never in history have we faced this. Think tanks, these these modern think tanks are telling us now that the great battle is between Islam and Christianity now. And Islam against democracy. And uh, mosques are being built all over the world, all of the United States. Here in New York, they're building mosques. You can see these incredible mosques, all financed by Arab oil money. And the boast is that we we are going to destroy infidel, infidel uh, Christianity. Well, folks, I want to tell you, my Bible says they're not going to win. The Bible says all of these forces, all of these hindrances, all of they. All right, I talked about this a, a, a week or so ago about. Uh, the Supreme Court deciding that no, there could be no display of the Ten Commandments in any federal court building, or, or federal, or, or even a state court buildings. And, and now they're tearing it down and they're grinding it off the granite walls. But, but the, the Lord God says, let them grind. Let them take it down. It's not going to hinder the gospel. It's not going to hinder this gospel. Nothing is going to hit it. Not communism. They, they said in Albania, they declared Albania to be a, a totally atheistic society. The government made a declaration. We are an atheistic nation. Declared it in the Constitution. And the Holy Ghost started working in Albania. And bless God, one of these days soon we're going to be able to go there and hold meetings. 
But they can't stop the moving of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It shall not be hindered if it is preached with confidence. It happened in China. They tried to persecute the church out of existence. And now millions upon millions of Christians in small homes and in groups all over China now by the millions. Oh, hallelujah. Can't be put out. Let the heathen rage, let the Islamics boast that they're going to prevail. Let the atheist, elitist try to legislate God out of our society. Let the Supreme Court legalize gay marriage. Let the persecutors try to persecute the gospel out of our out of the system. Let the prince of powers and powers of darkness rage. Let the heathen rage. The Bible says this gospel shall go forth unhindered. It shall not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. We see in Europe right now paganism taking over most of Europe, a real pagan spirit secularizing, coming into the church. In Sweden now, 30% of those who were, who were together, li- they're living together, 30% of the population living together, unmarried. Marriage is our, the, the percentage of marriage is falling, and those just living together are rising it's all over Europe, especially in Sweden. And, and we see all of these things happening, hindrances to the gospel the, the apostasy and the uh, court systems that are ruling against uh, Judeo-Christian family values and all of these hindrances that are gathering, materialism, lukewarmness, all of these hindrances and all these oppositions, nothing in this world, nothing that the ungodly culture does can hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing. But I'm telling you, we who preach it and we who live it can hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not the world that concerns the Lord. The wicked, the Bible said he laughs at the nations rising up against him. He said they're just little specks of dust in the measuring cup. He said they, 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 it, it, that, that does not Yes, it grieves God, but that's not his concern. God's concern is his church. You see, the unbelief that Jesus faced in the hearts of those, even his disciples, it was the unbelief that hindered his work. He said, I can't do many works there because of their unbelief. And I want to go into that for just a few minutes, if you will, please. I've been examining my heart in the past weeks. I've been traveling in, in conferences for ministers. I've been preaching this pulpit for over 17 years. And I'm seeing all these things that are happening around the world, all the methods, all the new programs, expensive programs, and everywhere I go, I hear these new things being introduced. And they, they, many ask, well, Brother Dave, what, you, you, you pastor what they call a mega church. God help you to raise up a church that is sta- substantial witness to the world. What's the plan? I mean, what, what can we do? What can you give us? We'd like to do what you're doing there with your pastors and your team in New York City. And when I I look at it, and I see a world that is turning apostate, and I see all these things that Jesus said coming upon the earth when men's hearts are going to fail them for fear, I say, God, I'm one man. What do you want me to do? I fast. I pray. I try to go to the ends of the world. But the older I get and the closer I get, to the last run around the course. The more I think of only one thing, and that's the day I stand before Christ. When he said, everything is going to be tested by fire. 
Every work. Every work. He said, every one of us, you and me, are going to stand on that day. And when I think of that, I say, oh, God, I'm looking over my life of all the things I've, you've called me to do, the ministries that you placed in my hand, the buildings that I built, the, the purchase, the ministries you had laid on my heart and started and all of these things. And one day I'm going to stand before God and all of these things are going to be brought up and, and tested in the outer holiness of Christ. The fire is just the absolute holiness, the piercing uh, love, the utter, utter holiness of God where nothing of the flesh can stand. Nothing of flesh can last a moment because suddenly it's in a flash and it's gone. Now, every soul I've won, not going to burn. No, no, all, all of those things that have been under the blood, those, those people that have been won, I don't, they don't lose their soul. The, even a cup of cold water that's given in the name, in love to a prophet, it's going to have its reward, Jesus said. And many are going, many are going to stand there and all their works are going to survive the fire. And I never questioned my salvation because Jesus said when the fire comes, well, let me read it to you. He said, let every man be careful how you build. Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it. The day when we stand before Christ. That's the day of the Lord. It's going to be revealed by fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. This day of the Lord, the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Peter talks about when judgment begins in the house of the Lord, there are going to be some that are scarcely saved. Folks, I don't want to be scarcely saved. I don't want to stand before him. I don't want the works. The thing, I don't want to have to stand before him and see it all born. So I'm, I'm, Lord, all my lifetime and I have nothing to offer you. I thank God for the souls. None of that is going to be lost. All of the things that he said he would do for you, he will do. But you see, I had to look at, Lord, did I hinder in any way your gospel? Paul the Apostle said, <clears throat> he really looked at his life. He said, I, I have to be careful how I, how I come to the people. I can't be a materialistic-minded man. He said, because I, I'm, that I might not cause hindrance to the gospel of Christ. That the way I live. You see, if I come to church and, and I sit here like the Corinthians did when they had communion and the rich were bringing these fancy lunches and, and their wonderful steaks and their wonderful uh, fruits and they were sitting there in their little cliques and in their tables and the poor among them didn't even have food. And he's saying, if you come to church and, and you're just thinking about how... You, you're going to make it. You have your eye on your future and how to make more money, how to have better stuff. And you're not even considering. You're not sharing. You're, you're not concerned about the needs of the body. You're not concerned whether the brother next to you needs to have money for the next meal. He said, I'm, I judge myself that I'll not be judged. I judge myself because I'm going to stand before Christ. And when I stand before Christ, crowds won't mean anything. Numbers won't mean anything. Techniques won't mean anything. Plans of man, methods of men will mean nothing. Much of it will not endure the fire. We stand before him. You say, well, oh, Brother David, I've learned now to just put everything under the blood. Everything, yes, is under the blood. These are blood-washed people that are going to stand before Christ. We're going to stand before Him. And God says, the, the Scripture says, your salvation is not in jeopardy. But I'm going to judge the heart and the purpose and the motive. 
Were you trying to make it? Were you trying to be somebody? Were you trying to be recognized? Were you trying to just prepare your own future without the care of the future of others? Were you just trying to have a safe haven and forget the whole world? Did you merchandise the gospel? You see, Paul the Apostle said, I determined to preach to you the whole counsel of God. Let me tell you that I could stand here, these pastors could stand here, and week after week we could tell you Jesus saves. Jesus wants to bless you. Jesus wants you to be happy. Jesus wants to give you miracle after miracle. Jesus wants you to be abundantly blessed. That's pure gospel. That's true. But it's only half the gospel. It's only the half. It's not the whole counsel of God. And this is what I stand before God and every pastor of this church when you stand before Jesus. Did you preach all of these things? Yes. But remember, there is a only one gospel that is unhindered. Only one gospel that is mighty. Only one gospel can truly save. And that's the full gospel. That's the entire gospel. That's the whole counsel of God. That includes repentance, godly sorrow, preparation for persecution, yearning for the coming of Christ. Beware of the deceitfulness of sin. Beware of lukewarmness. Beware of the deceitfulness of riches. Without holiness, no man shall see God. And then there's the cross, the blood, the sacrifice. There's heaven and there's hell. You see, Jesus ministered miracles. He ministered bread and meat to the multitudes. He blessed and he healed. But one day a message came forth. And there were no miracles this day. There was no bread. There was no fish. Jesus, knowing his his time is short, this man who had preached such a marvelous good news, he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And they get together, and the Bible said this, this was a multitude he spoke to, and these were his disciples. These were those who were followers of Jesus. And he says, does that offend you? And then I hear a modern generation say, we can't make the gospel work today if we offend people. Don't talk about being washed in the blood. Don't talk about blood sacrifices or eating flesh. But Jesus comes back. The Bible says, and from that day on, they said, that's a hard message. Who can receive it? And so the Bible said, from that day on, they forsook him. If Jesus came to many of our churches today, and God forbid that it would ever happen here. I don't believe it could happen here. He can go many churches, and, and I mean this with love. He can stand there, and if he stood and preached that same message, if he preached that message, you have to eat my flesh, you have to drink my blood, you, you have to see the spiritual meaning of this. Jesus says, I'm asking everything of you, all of this other food, this movie junk, this TV junk. And all this other stuff that you've been feeding on has to go. I have to be the one you're feeding on. These churches would empty. You see, there are times that I've stood in this pulpit. And I've never claimed to be a prophet. You've never heard me once boast of being a prophet. But there are times I prophesy. There are times I've had to preach a hard word. Same with every pastor here. I've, I've seen Pastor Carter and Pastor Neil struggle before they got because they knew that they had a word that could pierce and break through. And, and some may not know how to receive it. But there are times, and even lately, that I've preached 
what we would consider a hard message. I preached the hardest message. And I walked out that door. And I walked to my apartment, didn't say anything to anybody. I didn't want to talk to anybody. And I went home and started crying. And I, for two weeks, I would say to my wife, and I, I even called Pastor Carr, I said, did I wound the congregation? And I'm not looking for sympathy or pity or anything else. But I know how that affected me. And because there was one verse in this Bible that burns in my soul and affects me every time I get up to preach. It is Proverbs 17:15. He that justifies the wicked and he that condemns the just, even both are an abomination to the Lord. It says this, I cannot in any time, no matter how I feel the word, I cannot get up in my flesh and condemn the just. But at the same time, God help me to examine my heart and what I preach. Lord, have I held back anything? Is there something I'm preaching that makes people feel good in their sins? That they, 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 that they have to repent? That there's a work that God has to do and He will not do His covenant work without our association, without our cooperation. And I have to say every time, especially when I preach covenant or when I preach the blessing and the grace of God, I have to be very, very careful that I preach the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. That I do not comfort men in their sins. And you will not find that in Times Square Church. If you're visiting here and you say, well, I like this church, well, be prepared. My beloved friend, be prepared sometime to hear a message that will make you uneasy. Because this is the only prevailing gospel. This is the only unhindered gospel. It has to be the whole gospel in this Bible. Give me just two minutes. What about this? This You say, I'm not a preacher, Brother David. You're preaching to preachers now. No, I'm preaching to the congregation. The only thing I want to say, and the Lord put this and told me, I had to say this before I close the message. The gospel that you have witnessed to your family. You're sitting here, you have an unsaved loved one, someone you've been praying for. I'm telling you, you dare not ever give up. Because this gospel that you live and this gospel that you preach is not being hindered by anything, can't be hindered by anything. It's not the unbelief in your unsaved loved ones. It's the unbelief in your heart and mine. That's where the hindrance is. You see, the Holy Ghost breaks through. They don't have the capacity to believe until the Holy Spirit breaks through. And the Holy Spirit begins to reveal Christ. But you see, you and I have to have confidence in this gospel we preach and in the prayers that we pray. I don't care who, I don't care how, how many hindrances you see be, right now when you think of that precious loved one or those loved ones in close to you and your family. And the Lord made this so clear to me. Some of you have given up. You don't have the faith. You once did, but now you don't believe it's impossible. Impossible. They're too hard. I serve a God said nothing's impossible with him. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. And God can break through. And this, I'm telling you now, if you have witnessed to them, whatever you've witnessed, that gospel seed that you, it's going to, it's a mighty gospel and it's going to get through. It may be on a deathbed. It may be only on a deathbed that they get through, but God's going to hear your prayer. I'm asking this church to take back its faith. Lay hold of faith for the unsaved loved ones because the gospel that we preach to our loved ones is still an unhindered gospel. The devil cannot stop it. The spirit of the age can't stop it. The sin in the heart of your loved ones can't stop it. Unbelief is the only hindrance.
You say, well, I can't accept that, Brother David. There are other issues. Yes, there are other matters. There, I, I'm saying this, but you have to be free on your part. I want to stand before God knowing that I have believed and I have trusted this gospel that I preach, that I can believe God, that my son, my daughter, my husband, my wife, my parents, I believe that God can save them. And I'm, I'm not going to let go. And every day I'm holding on to it. I've seen one after another come because I believed and I have held on and... My one sister at a deathbed, but God answers prayer. Will you stand? Aren't you glad we have a gospel that's going to prevail? That every other gospel is going to submit. One day, the Bible said, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess before our Christ. Call him Lord and Savior. I don't worry about Islam. Islam. I don't worry about the homosexual agenda. I pray for the homosexual community. And I know you do too. Let's not worry about the, the government and the legislation. Right now, they're being, Christians are being persecuted all over the world. But in the midst of that persecution, the gospel is prevailing. I trust this gospel. Hallelujah. What a power we have in this gospel. God, take away our unbelief. If the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart in the annex here in the main auditorium, if God has truly spoken to you this morning, something, say, I don't know what God's dealing with you about. I could name a whole lot of things. I don't want to name anything. But you, you say, Pastor David, the Holy Spirit has moved me. And God's speaking to me. And you need some time face to face with Jesus. There may have to be some repentance, maybe for unbelief. Maybe you don't know Christ. You're coming here. It's the first time you've been here. <clears throat> but there's something pulling and drawing at your spirit, your heart. Or you're here and you say, Pastor Dave, and I want to be careful on this. I don't want just everybody to come. But I want those who have, have to say, I have truly given up on my faith. I'm thinking of one person you pray for, one person, not a whole group, not your whole family, but one person in particular that you have given up on and thinking is too hopeless. I want you to, if the Lord speaks, you can come. You that are here, would you look this way, please? I'm not going to preach another sermon, just a few words. I believe from the heart of the Lord. Jesus, speak to us now, and I'm asking you, to go deep into our hearts so that this is more than just coming forward. But this is something that becomes a commitment. That when we walk out the door, some changes are being made. Changes are being made. Now you can look this way. See, only the Holy Spirit knows why you came forward. I don't know why you came up here. If, if there are 100, 150 here or so, whatever it may be, there'd be 150 different reasons why the Holy Spirit urged you to come forward. I don't know. But He's one Spirit who bides in us all. And there's only one answer. And that's that the Holy Spirit will always bring you to the love of Jesus. He'll bring you into the heart of Christ. And when He draws you forward, He's not bringing you just to the front of the church. He's bringing you to a greater commitment to Jesus Christ. He wants you to make a deeper commitment. First of all, to believe Him. To believe Him on your job. And as you live before Him, Righteously, You live before the world and your co-workers righteously that that gospel that's being preached by what you're living is going to have power. 
You may not hear about it, but it's working. Something's happening every time you live it. Every time you're honest. Every time you don't cheat. Every time people see that you're living a different lifestyle than theirs. Every time you turn away from their dirty jokes. Every time you come as sick as you may be and as burdened as you are. Your finances may be over your head and you'll be feeling bad. But there's something of, of a quiet confidence in your heart and they see it. You're not spilling your guts to them. You're, you're just you're saying, yeah, I'm going through a hard time, but I know my God is able. And every word that you speak comes out of you is having an impact. That is what we're talking about. That's the unhindering of the gospel. And that's what God wants you to commit to right now, Lord Jesus, that I will live so before my wife, my husband, my children. Many children are not serving the Lord because they've been hindered by the screaming and the dishonest and hypocrisy of parents. So say, oh God, let me not be a hypocrite before my children. Let me not scream at my kids. The simple things. God's not calling you to be a great missionary. He's not calling you to build something or do something. He's asking you to live something of his life. Just to live that and say, Jesus, by that, I want my unsaved loved ones to know that what I have is genuine. That they can look at me and say, well, if I ever give my life to Christ, that's what I want. They've got to see that in you. Even if you have to make a confession that you haven't been living that way. And say, forgive me, I've not lived my life as I should before you. But by God's grace, I will. Lord, I ask you now, by your spirit, oh God, to speak. You're not trying to condemn anybody. You're trying right now to bring us out of our self-centeredness. And help us to judge ourselves that we be not judged. Just to judge our life, to look at it and say, is my life pleasing to Christ? Am I living honestly without hypocrisy before my family, before those that I work with? Lord, do that, we pray now. And help us to make those changes. Will you pray this prayer with me right now? Lord Jesus, cleanse me and forgive me of my sins. Forgive my unbelief. I will trust you. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to remind me where I have failed to live like Christ. Remind me every day and help me to follow through. I will trust you to give me clean eyes, clean hands, and a pure heart. Jesus, I love you, and I trust you. You have touched me. Now let me walk out of here with peace. Now let me pray for you. Father, you heard. It's just a simple prayer, but we've seen it work time and time again for many years. Right here in this church, at the same place, this same altar area, lives have been changed. People have been changed. Families have been changed. And God has done such miracles. And we give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. And the last amen I want to give to you, everyone, wherever you're at, make a commitment right now. You don't have to fall on your knees. You don't have to shake. You don't have to cry. It's a commitment of faith. As I walk out of here today, I'm going to believe God for the salvation. Now, I'm not limited you to one or two, but there are some that you especially have to have to. Just uh, bathe in prayer and hold them up in prayer. But that prayer that you pray will not work unless you truly believe God is going to hear you and answer you, that God is faithful to his word, that this word is powerful. And that word, uh, uh, pray the scripture. Don't, don't go up and just words coming out of your mouth. Pray the scripture and, and stand on those scriptures and believe God. Now, please don't get anxious if it doesn't happen in a day, a week, or a month, or a year. It'll happen. And you'll see evidence. God will give you evidence. If you keep praying, he'll give you some kind of a sign or evidence. And he'll just to encourage you to keep on. God bless you. God be with you. This is the conclusion of the message.